Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Evan Snyderman, and I'm the co-owner and co-founder of R & Company, a design gallery in New York City, specializing in historic and contemporary design. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a Zoom talk between Daniela Ohad and Nancy Lorenz. Um, our company is thrilled to host today's discussion between Nancy and Daniela. Um, you know, Daniela Ohad, I'll introduce you first. Um, Daniela has been a, a longtime friend of the gallery. Um, and Daniela's uh, spent the last two decades committed to education in design history. Um, committed uh, really to the, the study of theory, taste, the decorative, and the decorative arts. She's taught at Parsons, the New School of Design, Pratt Institute, the School of Visual Arts, Bard College, and is currently teaching at the New York School of Interior Design. I had to read this list because it's so long. Um, <laughs> so um, Daniela also advises clients on collecting design uh, and contributes regularly to public publications. Uh, um, and also sits on several uh, acquisition committees in major institutions in New York City. So, Daniela, thank you for joining us today. Um, and next, Nancy Lorenz uh, is a contemporary artist who lives and works in New York City. Um, and Nancy has been a fixture in the decorative arts community of New York City um, for a long time. Um, and uh, after spending several years of living in Japan, uh, Nancy went on to earn her BFA uh, in painting and printmaking at the University of Michigan and later received her MFA from Tyler School of Art, my own alma mater. So that is fantastic. Uh, Nancy was also the recipient of the John Simon Guggenheim uh, Award in 1998. And her work can be found in numerous private and public uh, collections internationally. So. Um, some of you may know Nancy's work. Nancy's known for her use of luxurious materials such as lacquer and um, uh, mother of pearl and also um, gold leaf. And really um, for blur blurring the lines between uh, fine and decorative arts, which is something that you know, we at R and Company are very uh, familiar with and can appreciate. So I am uh, gonna hand this over now to Daniela and we're really thankful to have you both here and I look forward to this exciting uh, discussion. Evan, thank you and also I want to thank you for inviting me for this talk with Nancy because the moment I entered her studio, I think it was probably three years ago, I totally fell in love with her work. Mm -hmm. So that's a perfect match. So hi, Nancy. How are you? I'm well. I'm so um, thankful to have the opportunity to, to see both of you. I, I love my design community, and um, I miss you all. So it's, it's nice to be together. And, and I know you are in the studio, and I'm going to ask you later to give a little tour of the studio. And I see among the audience, like some very, very old friends. So welcome everyone to this talk. And I want to start next. I decided to start with Hotel Okura in Tokyo. And this hotel was opened in 1962. Um, it was very close to the US embassy. And it was nothing like any Japanese hotel before. It actually came to host every president of the US since Nixon and many, many heads of states. Um, and it was designed by a minimalist a architect, Harvard graduate, Japanese architect, Yoshiro um, Tanaguchi, as a modernist masterpiece showcasing Japanese craftsmanship. And I, and it's an icon of post-war um, architecture. And I started with it because I want to ask you, what does this mean to you? Well, um, this, this brings back so many memories. When um, I was 13, my family moved to Tokyo and we actually lived in the Hotel Okura for the first five weeks. So um, one day I'm, uh, you know, a kid in a 
um, hanging out at the Galleria Mall in Houston, Texas, and the next morning, you know, I've woken up in this, this amazing hotel. Um, and fast forward, you know, five years later, when we're moving from Tokyo, we're living there again, and I'm realizing um, how much my aesthetics have been shaped by not only that lobby, but of course the whole five years in Tokyo. And you see here, there's the, um, the mix of um, Danish modern, there were Meiji era screens to your left there in that image you see, um, if you're sitting in those chairs, you see a perfectly framed um, bamboo garden and rock garden. And so it was this idea of this whole environment that kept, um, I kept going back to, and I still go back to it as kind of a source of comfort, but also just, it's a major uh, aesthetic touch point for me, that the lobby of this hotel. And it's totally memorable. You know, I, I'm actually jealous that you had the opportunity <laughs> to live in Japan because you know that this is something that we share the love for Japan and for the aesthetics and for everything about the culture of Japan. And this is you in the studio. So I want to start by asking you, Nancy, what is Japanese in your work? And I have some really amazing images of you in the studio. Yes, well, there's a lot that um, I've taken from those years in Japan. First of all, I spent those five years, um, I was lucky enough to be able to travel to various artisans studios. So whether it was a potter or a textile artist or woodblock master, um, I got to visit these national treasures and I fell in love with the sublime craft traditions in Tokyo. And I wanted to, I wanted to do it myself. I mean, that's where I decided I wanted to become an artist. Um, so here, what you see in these pictures, I'm, I am actually walking on them. They're large uh, commissions um, for a hotel. This was done about five years ago. And they're based on, um, in large part, um, studies of water and um, rock gardens. And many of those, like my, my sense of space is very much shaped by um, Japanese screens. So cloud shapes and, and they're, you know, abstractions of nature, basically. And, and, and I also want to ask you, I mean, what we look here, um, there is nothing like this in Japan, but I can also sense something that relates to Italian craftsmanship. Yes. So um, fast forward, I, re I moved from Japan. I'm in, I, I go to University of Michigan and abstract expressionism was the thing in the art department there at the time. We had some major influences there. And I love the idea of the physicality of doing these large paintings. Um, actually, dance is one of my, um, probably my, it's the one art form that actually makes me cry, but um, at, uh, with joy. Um, and um, I'm not a dancer, but in these paintings, I feel like the, the physical gesture is really important. But back to the Italian um, influence, um, I end up in Rome, my second year of graduate school. And of course I fell in love with the gold craftsmanship, the Sienese panel painting. And so little by little, all these things kind of fuse together in, in my paintings. And so sometimes while I, I get very involved in the minutia of the craft, I also feel like it's important to breathe life into the paintings with um, the gestures. And so here I am in my current studio. This was taken last summer. And um, even though actually in that picture, I had, a, I had just broken my kneecap. So I'm looking a little awkward there, but um, um, I still managed to, to do these paintings by walking on them. So do you always paint on the floor? For the large works, yes. Yeah, and then I have to put them up or, uh, so that I can actually see so what, going what I've done. Some of these images soon, but I want to, before we leave Japan, I want to take you to one more stop. Ah, uh, favorite place in the world, Talk Kyoto. To me. What, what, do uh, what do you think about this place? Because to me, everything. And most of my students are here and they know because I've already said it before in the past. 
to me, this is basically the most beautiful place on earth. I have to agree. I mean, there are, well, there's so many places in Kyoto that I absolutely adore. Uh, and this is one of them. I love the, uh, when you go from room to room, it's this concept of um, bringing the outside in and everything, nature being framed by these perfect views of, of um, from, from the interior. I love the idea of the, um, shoji screens dividing the space in different ways, which I think is gonna be very um, useful these days as we're now redesigning our homes to function in different multiple ways. Um, I also love, um, well, the history. I mean, there, it's mentioned in Tales of Genji, uh, you know, references to the moon on the water. It's just, um, it, it's just one of my favorite places. The sublime harmony of all the proportions inspires a kind of reflection that um, is, you know, so needed. So, so we share this love, but you also have a very strong connection in terms of your work to Kyoto. And I want to start with, these are really such favorites of mine. <laughs> the boxes. The art boxes. They are made in Kyoto. The boxes themselves, yes, the uh, Paulonia boxes. I um, had taken tea ceremony, and so I always fell in love with the boxes that housed the um, ceramic teacups and implements. So I contacted the, the, the maker of those boxes, and um, I, I send them dimensions, and then I do my irreverent um, materials on top of them, in this case, cardboard. So. I've, you know, the desire to transform everyday materials into something much more uh, luxurious is um, constant in these boxes. And letting the materials do what they do. So with the poured works, um, that is, well, that's a continuation of many things. It's got my, my years in Rome in there, but it also, um, Evan mentioned I'd gotten a, a Guggenheim grant, and during that year, I took a year, it really changed my life, but I explored all kinds of materials. Um, I decided I would do a drawing for each of the elements in the periodic table of elements. And the first element that I did was um, uh, mercury. I wanted to portray mercury by I realized I could water gild um, a pour and burnish it and make it look like liquid mercury. So um, from that came this whole body of work, which I still continue. And, and these boxes are at R and you made them for R and Company. These are at R and Company. One is yes, in a, in a different wood, right? What's that? They're made in different woods. Uh, it's all this base. Actually, I'll get one. Let's see. Uh, it's all, it's all, I don't know if you can see me. I can't see myself, so I don't know if you guys can see me. Is yeah, that, can, see can you see this? Okay. Um, so this is how they start. They're all this Paulonia wood. And they're beautifully made. So... And here we see another one. Uh, so these are, I call them art boxes. Is that okay? Okay. How, how do you call them? I just call them the boxes. Um, but you know, they're, they're, I do probably about 10 a year, maybe, maybe, maybe less. Um, and basically they're kind of a nice way to experiment when I'm in between doing all these other larger projects. And I can experiment with materials in this way. But in this case, it's a writing box. You could, you know, they're functional. And this is, and each one is different. And I want to ask you, what, what is contemporary? I, I'm going to tell you what I think is contemporary about those boxes and how they fit within the world of selecting contemporary design. Um, first of all, they're each one, each one of a kind, and you're using the craft which is maybe a known craft and, and known materials, but you use them in a very different way, in a very personal way they have never seen anyone use before. And they are also a, a great combination of East and West. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So what, what sure. do you think, how do you think about the boxes as contemporary? Well, um, because they're small works, I, I think the contemporary part might be the freedom I have with them. As you said, they're all different. And I've always loved those artists that um, don't do the same thing all the time. I mean, well, I, I love like Agnes Martin, of course, and all those people that can do the same thing all the time, but I'm not one of those artists. I like to um, experiment, juxtapose materials. Maybe what's contemporary in this box is um, the luxury, the luxurious materials juxtaposed to sort of the everyday material. It's not trying to be one thing. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's, that's really, really interesting. So each one is different. Each one has a different dimension. It's a little bit hard to see, but they are just gorgeous. And I was so happy when our and company started to show these boxes because- Thanks to you. This I, is all thanks to you. Also, I want to say that I live with one of them in my home and it's really a source of pleasure. But I oh. saw the first time I saw the boxes was the one that you did for Temple. I believe Temple is here as well. So Temple is St. Clair. Hey, Temple. I don't- that she's here. Um, yeah, that was a really fun collaboration with a friend who whose work I adore. And she approached me, she had done this, was making this very special series of uh, mythical creatures, exquisite, exquisite jewels. And she, her idea was to have a home for each one of these mythical creatures. In this case, it's the dolphin. And so, um, you know, I created a unique home for each of these, these magnificent pieces and of jewelry. Here are, more, here are more examples. So there were really couture jeweler, jewelry, jewelry that she was looking to um, have something very special. That was a really project. fun project. And she went to you. And she went to you. And you know what's really, I mean, the thing about commissions or collaborations is, um, you know, it, it just makes my world bigger. And I never would have made these, this kind of box, but having this kind of, these parameters with um, having to relate to these, these pieces of jewelry was a really interesting way to grow and experiment and, and make the work richer. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I thought about these jewels in those boxes is mm -hmm. something that was so stunning. Uh, but you also worked uh, with other fashion designers. Oh, yes. Um, this was the beginning of my collaboration with Thomas Meyer. Um, he had been collecting my work and I just, we had the most lovely series of studio visits. This, this series started in 2002 and I did um, a series of 15 uh, unique paintings that he asked, would I, could I make 15 paintings that he would set into his, these exquisite leather clad boxes. Um, so this was kind of, um, you know, a very limited series. And then we ended up doing another collaboration in 2003 and 2000. 15. Yeah, you did, you, you worked twice with them. Um, so let's move to the panels. Well, the panels are, you know, work of art, and they are uh, also represented at our own company. Uh, what can you tell us about those panels? So this series is a newer series of, um, well, I, you know, I'm loving textiles. I think everybody's uh, right now, especially wanting that earthiness um, of craft and, you know, comfort, like um, in the work of, say, Sheila Hicks. Um, and I love tapestries. And, uh, but this was a way I used um, ordinary gardening jute, which is a, um, it's a material that binds roots of trees. And so I stretched that over my stretchers and then did my uh, gold pores. So, the, you know, the, it was the, the original inspiration was, um, oh, and I love this piece because of the transparency um, and how the light comes through. It is quite, quite beautiful when they're kind of around in the studio. Yeah, it's glowing. And what, you, what fascinates me is that how you take those panels 
and making them in a very large, enormous scale for various uh, interior spaces, mm. in, uh, both private we're going to see, but also you have worked uh, extensively with Peter Marina on yes. all of the Chanel boutiques. What is this like? This is, um, oh, I, you know, my collaborations with Peter started, well, it was, I guess it was Frank Debiasi that brought, um, do you know Frank? Um, he brought Peter to my studio over 20 years ago. Actually, I just came, I just found my, these old, these samples. This is the very first um, Chanel sample from 2000. And I had been restoring um, Coromandel screens to support myself early on. I, I restored Asian antiques. And so when Frank brought Peter to my studio, I said, you know, well, let's just, let's make a modern adaptation of Coromandel screens. And um, of course, referencing Coco Chanel's exquisite apartment. Have you been to that apartment? And, um, in the first, it's so beautiful, and it's it's wall to wall. They they disassembled all these screens, but it's wall to wall, Coromandel screens with, um, you know, wheat uh, gilt tables, and it's just the most beautiful interior. So we were we were referencing that with these um, these commissions, and have to thank Peter for uh, you know he and many of these designers are keeping artists in business because these, um, he always incorporates art into his projects, which I really appreciate. Yes, totally. And maybe, yeah. and, and, and turning those projects, you know, like stunning places, they uh, really elevate the shopping experience in all of this. But here we also see, you want to Michael Smith, Michael Smith, who's also, he's just been the best. Um, we've, we've been doing a lot of communicating over this, um, the past three months, even though we've been shut down, we've been discussing many projects. And this one is one of my favorites. Um, so there's that, I did a 12 panel piece called Rock Garden Room that was originally exhibited in, um, uh, let's see, it was exhibited at J. Grimm Gallery. It was a Chelsea gallery. This, this was a 12 panel piece that when you looked at it from the street, it, you could see the, um, that's all, it filled up the whole gallery. It was a tiny, tiny gallery. And I love that piece. And we were, maybe we were gonna use it in this breakfast room, but it, in the end it didn't really fit. So we decided to recreate it. Only you can see there's cutouts there for the- um, This is the air condition? the air conditioning van and the door. And so the way these commissions work is that the client's contractor will fit the room with panels that are unprimed. Then they come to me at my studio here in Queens and I do the artwork and then the client's contractor reinstalls. And this was a very beautiful um, a breakfast room. And it's, it's uh, mother of pearl inlay, uh, silver leaf, gold leaf lacquer. So, so you work a lot with interior designers, right? Do you work with interior designers, American specifically, or all over the world in terms of their, their location? I work all over the world. I get, I get requests from uh, international sources, for sure. Yeah, I've had we're a- gonna get, We're gonna get a very shortly, we're going to get to your parent and super, super exciting commission. But just let's look first at two recent exhibitions, museum exhibitions that you had. And I remember visiting your studio when you were preparing for that show. Uh, so how do you see your work um, integrated in the idea of the botanical garden? Well, this was a natural. Um, it was a beautifully restored 18th century house. And so the scale of the exhibition space was just rich with all these possibilities, including um, the, this wall here that um, we, I hung these flowers. Um, this is a, a little reference to Degas' uh, dancer. With I always love that tutu in, you know, the, the day, uh, the dancer's skirt. Can 
Can you lift the flower a little ah. yeah. Can you see it? No. Hmm. Yeah, now. There. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so Degas Dancer, there's a, there's a, one of them is at the Clark, which is near this museum. So it was kind of a conscious reference to that. Um, but I love also the idea of bringing the outside in, like we were talking about the Katsura experience. Um, in this case, it's, it was in the Berkshires. And there is a lot of Japanese visibility in this exhibition. And I see that you had, and you walked with bronze. And what do we see here? So we see, what we see here is the opening. Um, back when we used to have openings. I'm sorry, that's my phone. I'm going to ignore that. Um, and he, what we see here is Kan Asakura, an Ikebana master. And he took um, cuttings from the botanical garden and brought them in and interacted with my bronze sculptures, some of which were fountains. So it was this beautiful performance of um, integrating what we love about the botanical garden and bringing it in, inside in a domestic setting. Um, I have one more from this, um, from this exhibition. Oh, uh, there's more of uh, Khan's brilliance. So um, he, I loved seeing how he changed my work. And um, in this case, he, he balanced these iris, stems of iris, into this piece of rods. Oh, here it is. Actually, these little experiments that I was making in bronze and then he just you know these were things that were sort of sitting around the studio and he managed to just levitate it and um, I just I love that collaboration with him seeing how he would use these elements in unexpected also, ways. Um, you also had another exhibition at the uh, San Diego. San Diego that was a that was a, a mid-career survey two years ago. How was this different than the one at the Botanical Garden? Well, it was much larger. There were 90, 90 pieces, um, but it was similar in the sense that, you know, it, it had some of everything. It had uh, my screens, my boxes, bronzes, smaller works. It was a much more formal setting. Um, oh, and look, that painting, I think you can probably see it, is here. So, um, yeah, that was kind of a, a, a good, um, good moment to sort of assess my, my history so far. And this was just, this was before we started working with our Yes, yes. Okay, um, I'd like to now move to our, to the last project. And I would like to encourage everyone to ask questions. We're going to get to the questions after a tour of Nancy's uh, studio. So this is the Steinway Tower on uh, West 57th Street. Um, really superb residential skyscraper. Very, very beautiful. Developed by JBS and designed by Sharp Architects. Um, and it was built where the original Steinway building stood, it was a, everyone, you know, New Yorkers remember it was a 1925 Art Deco Tower. Uh, it was the headquarter of the Steinway and Sons Pianos. And so this tower is, a, is nearly completed. And you have, a, an, I, I love this picture. <laughs> That's a crazy picture. Yeah, so Bill um, approached and me. You work with Bill Softfield on the elevator doors. Yes, yes, great introduction. Um, Bill is one of, well, he was the person that I owe so much to. He gave me my first uh, commission, which was the elevator doors at the Soho Grand. And that was in 1995. And he asked me to do in, uh, unique artwork on each of the elevator doors. The only problem was the doors had been, they'd already been installed. So that meant that <laughs> um, every evening I would go over and apply what's called oil size. And then in the morning I would lay the leaf and the leaf is, you know, these little squares of, that you put on one at a time. And, um, but the, about 300 workers were coming in and out of the, 
the place. So it was a little bit challenging. So when he came to me years later to do, I said, oh, here we are again doing the elevator doors. Um, he and I have both come a long way since then. So I'm grateful. Here I am in, um, this is at, um, I'm putting on a patina on the elevator doors. This is in uh, Dobbs Ferry at the studio of Malcolm McDougall, who is helping me with these, fabricating them. And, and why outdoor, Nancy? Why outdoor? Well, because it was so beautiful. I mean, it was like the fresh air and his studio is, he has a studio inside, but this was just such an opportunity. It's right there on the Hudson River. And you, you can see, see that. that do you still work on those doors? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm getting ready to do the next set. Um, we'll be doing them uh, in the coming month, actually. And here, here's the first set in progress. Mm -hmm. Wow, so how long, when do you think you're gonna complete the work? Complete them? I think, you know, they'll be ready, and I mean, I think they'll probably be done in, the, in another couple of months. These are installed already, this set. So Nancy, yeah. can, you, can you show us a little bit of the studio? Oh, sure. And then, I, then I'm going to ask whoever has questions, please type them where it says Q&A. And also, Kat, are these Nancy studio in the large screen right now? Can you see, you know what, I'm a little bit technologically challenged. I don't I, see. I wonder whether Kat, Kat, are you here? Is that, like, do we see it? Let me see somebody saying. Are you seeing me or can I turn the, I'm trying to turn the camera. We can't see, okay. Can you see? So I'm trying to turn the camera. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, we can see the studio right now. Oh, okay. So I just can't see it. So I'm not sh really sure what I'm pointing to, but I will just try to slowly walk around. You can, you can see the studio? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And can okay. you also show where the workers are if they are in the studio? I, the workers, I sent down the street. I'm right near Socrates Sculpture okay. Park. And so um, they are taking a long lunch okay. so we can have space. So I'm um, here is the heart of my more private work, which is my drawing. Um, I wish I could see what you're seeing, but I don't know, can you see these um, glass? Do you see that little paper screen that's made with glass? Yes. So that's the result. So I've been drawing every day like many artists during this time. And that's the result of recent um, events here in the city with where there was a lot of broken glass. Um, but it's, you know, it's that desire to mend and repair. And so there's a lot of work with broken broken glass, but trying to make some, some kind of sense of it, some kind of order. Um, here's my materials. I'm trying not to go too fast. This is um, a current commission for a home in Chicago. Um, more drawing, lots of drawing. Uh, here's some drawings. I don't know if you can see. I wish I could see. Oh, no, I can, we can see that. Do you see the three drawings that are kind of on mesh here? What is that blue? The blue up above. So these are, there's some, there's some paintings here for a, a possible commission with um, Goblock Gallery, which I'm, I'm looking forward to having, uh, doing, working with them in the coming year. Um, more drawings, more broken glass. Here's the studio that you saw before. Here's a panel for a, um, there's a blue panel there. Do you see that? Yeah. It's um, for, that's a panel for a yacht commission, one of four. You can see it's made on this corrugated um, panel, which is light and straight. More work up close. And here are, here's a view, long view. Oh, here's a view of my bicycle, <laughs> my beloved bicycle. Um, this is how I get to the studio every day. So it's about a six mile ride over the 59th Street Bridge. I get my exercise. 
and a couple of things in the works, a dining room project. Um, here's another up close, showing more of the process, mother of pearl. Beautiful. Okay, let's take the questions. Uh, I have uh, one question by Karen, and she's asking, are the elevator doors acid etch? If you can say something about that technique. Yes, they are acid etched. Um, we've, we came up with a system of, I wish I, let me just see. Is it on me or is it on the studio now? No, it's on you. We are okay. Um, so yeah, acid etching, um, it was a, a process where, um, you know, I did to scale drawings and then we transferred them onto the, t onto the panels and then everything was acid etched. And what you're seeing here in this image, this last image is um, the patina. Which and is I have cool. another question, like, uh, well, we have two cameras. One is Pamela Platt, and she's asking how many assistants do you have working with you and in what stages do they help you with your work? So I have a total of five assistants. Um, one of them is um, Julie, helps me with my office, all my office stuff, and she's working from home. And uh, now I have four student uh, assistants that were, you know, mostly former art students that come in at various times, um, not full time. Some it's kind of a flexible schedule right now, especially, but always. And they all ride their bikes here. Um, and so, yeah. And what they do, what they help me with the craft on these projects when it's so many square feet um, is it's so so many hours. So they help me with. Um, the sanding, cutting pearl, um, burnishing the gold. It's a lot of hours of just hands-on work. What, uh, do they work for you for a long time? I have, yes, I have had um, three assistants that have worked for me uh, 15 years, 12, 15 to 12 years, and then a few recent, but three that have worked for me for over 15 years, yeah. And I have also a question from Pamela Talesi. I hope that I pronounced your name correctly. Talese, oh. hi Pamela, hello. And she says, great to see you, your studio and your beautiful work again, Nancy. As we've all been locked down with our materials, are there any materials or themes that you've rediscovered or started to see in a new way? It's a great, great question. question. Pamela knows me well. Um, so, yes, and she knows how much I love my materials. Yeah, no, I've, I think, um, I mean, I've been really obsessed with the broken glass. Um, it's because I've really been full time here in the city, I've been trying to use things that I see every day. And um, I love the way this glass, well, the cracks are part of the luminosity. And so I'm trying to find ways to use glass, more glass in my work. Um, I'm curious once we can travel again. I had met through my gallery in Portland, Oregon, PDX, who, which I love, I love working with them. Um, they introduced me to a glass foundry. So when things open up again, I think I might start making some more things in glass. So I have a question by Sandra. Uh, when you are doing a commission, how much artistic freedom do you require? And would you ever walk away if you didn't have good chemistry with a person who was commissioned to work? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question too. Um, it's all over the map. I usually try to be quite agreeable in terms of, um, you know, setting out my parameters. Um, usually a commission starts with somebody who's seen something in the studio that they like, only they want it bigger. So that's kind of an easy, easy process. Um, and I try to set that expectation from the beginning, which is, you know, we can kind of work with things that I've kind of already made. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do something that's outside of my, my realm, basically. Um, what was the other part of the question? 
Whether you walk away. Oh, if I walk away. Well, I guess I've been tempted to, but <laughs> once you receive a 50% deposit, it's really hard to do that. Mm. You know, this, this talk is being recorded. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so I I'm have two more names. questions. Um, those are the two last questions. The first one is by Lynn. And Lynn is asking how large are the boxes? The boxes range from uh, four by five by five inches to 15 by 20 by 10. Thank you. And the last one is by Michael. Do you know, do you know the Laverne's? I love Laverne. You know what? I've just been, oh, the, there's another answer to Pamela's question. The other thing I want to do is um, uh, I want to start working with Cloisonne. So I'm developing some samples that are totally inspired by Laverne, who I just learned. Um, they used to have their studio not far from where I am. And so there's something um, kind of wonderful about that. You know, I never thought about you and Laverne, by the way. Do you get well, the question a lot? No, but um, it, there was a, um, I've always loved that work. And of course, some of the work is, he, they've taken um, directly from uh, core mantle screen panels. They've taken those designs. So there is a, there's a relationship. Oh, oh my God, that's it. We got to that's the end. Nancy, it. it was great. Thank you. Keep doing these amazing works that you do. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and also to our company to host this wonderful talk with Nancy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniela, for setting me up in such a great context. I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I love reading your blog. And thank you, R and Company, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. So have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and take care. Thank you.